This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Young climate activists around the world are taking to the streets today for a global youth climate strike, inspired by 16-year-old Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg and her weekly School Strike for the Climate. Faced with an uncertain future, last year, Greta started skipping school every Friday to stand outside the Swedish parliament demanding climate action. Her weekly act of protest quickly went viral, and the movement has since gone global. As part of today's global strike, tens of thousands have already marched in more than 100 towns and cities across Australia, where organizers estimate more than 300,000 protesters took to Australian streets alone in what would be Australia's biggest demonstration since the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. Protests were also held in Africa, Asia and Europe. More than 500 cities are planned in Germany alone, where today Chancellor Angela Merkel is set to announce a package of measures to reduce Germany's greenhouse gas emissions. Here are voices from Sydney, Thailand and Nairobi. We haven't seen any governmental action being taken since the last strike. And that means that we're going to keep fighting for the sustainability that we deserve and that we need, and um, the economic stability that we also want for our, for our world, the idea that renewable energy can be the alternative, that is the only option. This isn't a fringe movement. This isn't a greeny issue. This isn't a lefty issue. This is a human issue. Um, and it's terrific to see all these everyday, normal, workers, students, moms, dads, kids, babies here supporting the strike. A lot of youth can't vote. They don't have decision-making power in, you know, fossil fuel inv investments or um, plastic use, you know. But what the youth can do is, is talk about the problem and, and make noise about it and, and demand it from the people who can create a change. Climate change is real and it's coming for us. And it doesn't matter who you are. Whether you are rich or poor, this thing is real, and it, it, it doesn't isolate. Voices from some of the hundreds of actions happening around the world as part of today's global youth climate strike. More than 800 protests are planned in the United States, including here in New York City, where young people, environmental activists are gathering for a massive march just days ahead of Monday's United Nations Climate Action Summit, taking place here as part of its U.N. General Assembly meeting. Greta Thunberg is expected to speak at the summit on Monday, but today she'll address what's expected to be a massive protest in New York City, where public school students will be allowed to attend as long as they have a permission slip. Democracy Now! will be out on the streets with them, but right now we're joined by a roundtable of youth climate activists to talk about today's actions and the youth-led movement to fight the climate crisis. We're going to start here in New York. We have two guests. Shea Bastida is a cl climate justice activist originally from Mexico and an organizer with Fridays for Future New York. She's a student at Beacon High School. And Katie Eder is founder of the Future Coalition, where she's currently executive director. Katie, talk about the plan for the global strike today, where it came from, what you expect to see. And thank you for coming in before you go out on the street. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. So today, young people and adults across the world uh, will be joining together to strike from school and work to demand climate action. Uh, this is uh, the third international strike, um, deep strike that, that we're having, uh, and young people are have had enough. We're not going to sit around and watch our futures be destroyed before our eyes. We're going to stand up and do something. And why did you get involved with this? Um, you know, our, our future is being threatened. You know, the UN IPCC report that was released released last November says that we have till 2030 to change our trajectory before we see irreversible, irreversible effects of the climate crisis. Uh, and adults aren't taking action. Our elected officials, our world leaders, they don't seem to be treating like, they don't, they don't seem to be treating this like the emergency that it is. And so we have to show them, we have to tell them that they need to do something. Where are you originally from? I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And talk about what's happening there. Uh, in Wisconsin today, there are young people all across the state who are striking um, in Milwaukee and Madison. There are both massive strikes uh, that young people are attending to call on our governor to take climate action. 
Lucia Vestida. I bumped into you um, when uh, Greta Thunberg was taking that zero emissions high speed sailboat on that two week journey from Europe to the United States. As she came into New York Harbor, you were there to greet her and address the thousand people who were in the New York Harbor waiting for her. Um, you're from Beacon High School. Yeah. Why did you get involved with us? Um, so, my story goes way back. Uh, and I would say a lot of climate activists today didn't know we were climate activists until someone else called us that. I think that, personally, I've always cared about the environment, and I've always done my best, but it wasn't labeled until recently. And uh, for me, it was the power that I thought an individual voice had, which was inspired by Greta Thunberg's uh, message. Uh, and I also suffered the climate crisis myself. So when I was 13 years old in Mexico, in my town, my town suffered from heavy rainfall, and that also c caused our river there to uh, overflow, which had heavy contamination because of the factories that are near there. And so that was the first time that I saw the climate crisis firsthand. And it didn't really hit me that this was such a global issue until I came to New York City and I saw the effects that Hurricane Sandy had had on Long Island. And that was the moment where I realized that the climate crisis not only can follow you everywhere, but is happening everywhere and affecting low-income communities and communities of color the most. So what did you start doing? So I uh, became leader of my environmental club school. I started taking kids out to Albany and City Hall to listen to hearings and love your elected officials. And then when we heard about the climate strike, that was when I thought, you know, this is what we need to do to tackle this crisis as the emergency it is. And for the first global climate strike on March 15th, I got 600 of my peers to walk out to Columbus Circle for the first uh, climate strike. And what do you hear right now about activists in Mexico, where you come from? Um, I'm actually very happy to see the activism that is going on in Mexico. In Mexico City, there is a large presence of Fridays for Future Mexico. And actually, one of the activists there moved to New York City, and he was one of the lead organizers, and now he's uh, marching with us. And he um, is updating us about what's going on in Mexico, which is part of a global movement. And as an all. indigenous young woman, talk about the indigenous leadership of the global climate movement, even though you said you didn't really think of it as climate activism, mm -hmm. but as just being an activist for the sustainability of the planet. Yeah. For indigenous people, taking care of the earth is not a movement, it's a culture. And that's what I want to see uh, out of these strikes and out of our pressure. Uh, this shouldn't be a movement. This shouldn't be something that has momentum. It should be something that we live with every day. And so indigenous people's cosmology is that you take care of the earth because the earth takes care of you. And you need uh, reciprocity. You need to give back. And right now I'm seeing a lot of indigenous voices being lifted up, including in today's global strike. And we're saying all that knowledge of taking care of the earth for thousands of years is so important because the environmental movement didn't start 60 years ago. It's always been here. Today, before the massive uh, gathering at Foley Square, which will then head to Battery Park, where the major talks will be, first indigenous young people will be speaking out, and then international students. Yes, we're going to have a land acknowledgement uh, for to open the strike, and uh, part of the global youth who are going to be at the front of the march are going to include indigenous people from Brazil who have come and visited us to talk about what's going on in Brazil. Will you be a part of that? Yes. On Monday night, Amnesty International presented its 2019 Ambassador of Conscience Award to 16-year-old Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for Future movement. This is Greta speaking. Right now. I think there is an awakening going on. Even though it is slow, the pace is picking up and the debate is shifting. This is thanks to a lot of different reasons, but it is a lot because, because of countless of activists, and especially young activists. Activism works. So what I'm telling you to do now is to act. 
because no one is too small to make a difference. I'm urging all of you to take part in the global climate strikes on September 20th and 27th. And just one last thing, see you on the streets. That was Greta Thunberg speaking Monday night. See you on the streets, and those streets, well, they are filling up all over the world today. Yeah, that's right. Young climate activists are taking to the streets for the global climate strike, inspired by Greta and her weekly school strike for the climate. Protests already underway in Australia, in Europe, Asia and Africa. We're hosting a roundtable discussion with some of the organizers. Here in New York, we're joined by Shea Bastida, organizer with Fridays for Future New York. Uh, she's at Beacon High School. Katie Eder is founder of the Future Coalition, where she's currently the executive director. She's from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Joining us in Minneapolis, Isra Hersey is the executive director and co-founder of the U.S. Youth Climate Strike. She also happens to be the daughter of Democratic Congress member Ilhan Omar. Also in Minneapolis, Jawaria Jama is with the U.S. Climate Strikes and is the co-state lead for the Minnesota Youth Climate Strike. Isra Hersey, I want to start with you. Talk about what's happening in Minneapolis. Yeah, so here in Minneapolis, we're actually having the strike um, start at a park where we're going to be marching to our state capitol in St. Paul. And we're um, starting at 11.30, and we're going to be having speakers starting at 12.30 with um, speakers from environmental orgs in the state of Minnesota, as well as students. And then we're expecting to have booths and then an escalated action later after the speakers are done. And Isra, how did you get involved with this whole— um uh, with the whole movement, uh, why, how did you become executive director of U.S. Youth Climate Strike uh, as a high school junior? Yeah, um, at the time I was actually a high school sophomore, and in late January of this past of this year, I was contacted through Instagram to organize for the climate strike for March 15th because nobody was um, organizing um, nationwide, and so from there I decided to help organize and. Um, help co-found this group with two other individuals. Um, and then from there, I ended up um, being able to become the executive director of this group. Um, if you could also talk about what activism means. You certainly come from um, a, a legendary line of activists. Your mother, of course, is Congressmember Ilhan Omar. Did her activism uh, inspire you? Yeah. Um, as a, at a really young age, my mother and my father took me to protests starting in the first grade. Um, they got me involved with campaigns, and I, we continued going to protests as a family. Um, activism has always been a part of my life. I wouldn't necessarily say that I've, I've been entirely inspired. She'd probably say that I've inspired her. Um, but, you know, being in a family where activism is really valued has definitely helped shape to where I am today. Juwari Jama, you're sitting next to Isra, uh, you two with the U.S. Youth Climate Strikes, your co-state lead for the Minnesota Youth Climate Strike. Explain how you got involved, why the climate, why sustainability is so important to you. Yeah, so I recently got involved in environmental activism and climate in the climate justice movement this past year after witnessing the effects of climate change on my own community. I currently live in like a predominantly African American and low income community where we are right next to um, intersecting highways and also pollution by fossil fuel factories in Minneapolis. And a lot of that has um, affected the health um, of the people in my community, and it's affected myself and my family directly. And being able to witness these effects have gotten me um, inspired to get more people involved and to get more people to understand the effects of climate change and how they've disproportionately affected people of color and how we need to, you know, change the narrative, focus on people of color and continue building this movement and power. You are both Somali Americans. Talk about the effect of climate change, of global warming um, on Somalia. 
Yeah, so um, in the past few years, Somalia has had extreme amounts of droughts. Um, in 2017, they had an extreme severe drought where thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were affected and were becoming extremely food insecure. Um, and these droughts happen very constantly in Somalia, and those impacts have impacted both of our communities and our families that live out there, and these are continuously happening because of the climate crisis. And, and I would like to add that— Oh, go ahead, Juari. I like— I'd like to add that, especially like me being um, from North Minneapolis, I've seen the effects in both Somalia and also in my community at home. I've seen the way in which air pollution has affected, you know, like my health, but also the ways in which these droughts and food shortages, as Isra mentioned, affect our family back home. And Jawaria, what do you say to the president of the United States? You were born in Somalia. You came here to the United States as a refugee. You are deeply involved with the climate movement right now. President Trump is a proud climate change denier. So I was actually born in the United States, but my parents were immigrants from Somalia. And I would say, especially talking about the climate justice movement and climate change, that our president really needs to act for us and act for the people that are being affected. We need presidents and we need lawmakers that are interested in um, really making change for people that are directly affected and not, you know, doing money laundering and for um, people in power. And your message, uh, Isra, to, to the president, um, who— uh, as one of the most powerful people on earth, occupying the presidency of the United States, um, uh, has called climate change a Chinese hoax. Yeah, so, um, President Trump, your actions act are actually harming people. Millions of people across this country are being impacted by the inaction that you're not taking. And us young people are not going to stand down and allow this inaction to continue. We will continue to be on the streets until we see some change from your office, unless—and um, from there, we are going to be voting you out, because we need a leader that is actually going to take action on this um, incredible crisis. We're also joined in Washington, D.C., by two more youth climate organizers. Jerome Foster II is the White House climate strike organizer, founder and executive director of One Million of Us. Also in D.C., Kelsey Juliana. She's the lead plaintiff in Juliana versus United States, the landmark youth climate lawsuit against the U.S. government. Um, Kelsey, let's begin with you in Washington, D.C. Explain this lawsuit you have been a part of for a number of years. You're the named plaintiff. Yeah, thanks for having us, Amy. And this lawsuit is a constitutional climate change case against the U.S. federal government filed by 21 courageous young individuals um, in 2015. At the time, the youngest was eight and the oldest, myself, was 19. Uh, this case looks at the actions of the federal government for the past several decades of helping to perpetuate the climate crisis by continuing to fund the fossil fuel economy endangering the lives of all citizens, but especially disproportionately harming the lives of young citizens and future generations. So we're looking at the ways that the federal government has very knowingly and willfully funded this climate crisis um, and the way that they are continuing to stall and delay our climate case shows you exactly their priorities, their priorities of their own self-interest and continuing this greedy uh, fossil fuel economy, rather than uh, ensuring the constitutional lights, rights of life, liberty and property to all citizens, especially young. You spoke in front of the Supreme Court, uh, Kelsey Juliana, on Wednesday. What did you say? In front of the Supreme Court, um, you know, the message that I, that I felt was actually a message of mourning. I'm 23 years old, and I've been calling myself a climate activist since I was 10 years old. Um, you know, over half my lifetime, I feel like I've been trying to make an impact, make an impact. And it's incredible that right now we're in this moment where 300,000 people in one nation alone have marched for climate action. And it, they're followed by the world over who are really taking to the streets and saying, this is our time and, and our rights and our lives matter. But on Wednesday, you know, it is a period of mourning that we are having to do this, that we are asking children to literally beg for their lives, to, to, to have to fight for the security of a future. 
um, is is a huge shame on all political leaders, present and past. And uh, it's unfortunate that young people and that children are having to be in this position. Uh, but today, it's also very exciting that we are uh, feeling that fire and that leaders, um, the, the school board of uh, New York and, and others are um, allowing young children to champion their lives. I want to go to 17-year-old youth climate activist Jamie Margolin, the Seattle teen, co-founder of the climate justice nonprofit Zero Hour, one of the group of youths who sued the state of Washington and Governor Jay Inslee over greenhouse gas emissions. On college applications, I keep getting asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? The media, pop culture, businesses, and the whole world tells me that I and my whole generation will have something to look forward to that we just don't. You're promising me lies. Everyone who will walk up to me after this testimony, saying that I have such a bright future ahead of me, will be lying to my face. It doesn't matter how talented we are. It doesn't matter how much work we put in, how many dreams we have. The reality is my generation has been committed to a planet that is collapsing. The fact that you are staring at a panel of young people testifying before you today, pleading for a livable earth, should not fill you with pride. It should fill you with shame. Youth climate activism should not have to exist. That's the 17-year-old climate activist Jamie Margolin, um, Seattle. Um, uh, she's based in Seattle. Interestingly, she sued the state of Washington as well as uh, Jay Inslee, who's the governor who ran for president, has dropped out now. But he's the one who demanded a climate debate that the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, refused to commit to. In fact, Tom Perez, the head of the committee, said anyone who participated in a, a non-sanctioned debate, and they weren't going to sanction a climate debate, uh, would be prevented from participating in any presidential debates. Kelsey Juliana, talk about how her lawsuit uh, fits in with yours and in your lawsuit against the United States, what you're demanding. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm also suing the state of Oregon, and I've been on that case since I was 14 years old. It's nine years old. And, you know, we have young people taking legal actions against their, their states, as well as young people here in the United States, but all, over, all around the world who are taking action against their governments, because the time for talking is over. And we are not willing to wait around for someone else's timeline to dictate the trajectory of our lives. And, uh, you know, what we're asking for is courage courage from our political leaders and from these judges, because we're asking for an end to the system as usual, as young people are, are leaving their classrooms. You know, we're asking for a, a pause, a, a break away from the system as usual that is harming young people on the planet. And so from this federal lawsuit, we're asking for a um, court-ordered climate recovery plan, phase off of fossil fuels, uh, re invest in, in um, carbon sequestration, and also a constitutional right to a stable climate system capable of sustaining human life. I want to bring uh, Jerome Foster II into this conversation. When Greta Thunberg arrived in New York, soon afterward, she went down to Washington. Um, she didn't lead the strike in front of the White House. She joined the strike in front of the White House. And Jerome Foster II, you are the White House climate strike organizer and founder and executive director of One Million of Us. Talk about this project you have. In the corporate media, we rarely see these protests, but what have you been doing there, and what high school do you attend? So, I attend um, Washington Leadership Academy, based out of Washington, D.C., right off of Catholic University, which is an XQ super school, which really um, centers itself around the future and preparing students for their future. But really, at any school, in any time in, in the world, we're seeing that Education is really not prioritizing our future because we're actively destroying our future. And that's the work that I've been trying to do at the White House, is trying to call attention upon world leaders to take climate action seriously. And the three demands that I've been having is to have a call for moral clarity and for people to have political courage and for them to have intergovernmental unity. And that's the shirt that I'm wearing right now, is to have a call for international, international collaboration to stymie the climate crisis, because it is only in the cracks of division that corruption can seep in and pollution can, uh, can spew out. And that's really what I'm calling for at the White House climate strikes when I first started earlier this year, where I first mobilized around 400 young people from all across the DMV to come and really show 
the power of young people and show world leaders what real action looks like. And my work at One Million of Us is really to mobilize young people and to have a generational unity across the U.S. to, to educate young people around the issues of climate change, gun violence, immigration reform, gender equality, and racial equality. And we're working with March for Our Lives and Black Lives Matter and Women's March International and with the Fridays for Future movement to mobilize young people around educating them to vote and making sure that politicians don't just see us as young children who don't have an impact on our political system, but to see us as a strong, united political force, as a part of the growing, growing movement of one million of us, to have chapters on colleges, um, high school campuses, and also in community centers to educate them around the importance of their vote and why they should vote. So you were involved with the D.C. Clean Energy Act. You helped to pass it. Explain what it is. So the, the Clean Energy D.C. Act was really when I first started being a climate activist, um, really being involved, um, which was about um, a year ago um, in February. And after through that, I heard about the Clean Energy D.C. Act through Citizens Climate Lobby D.C. chapter. And this Clean Energy D.C. Act really um, reinvented D.C.'s energy usage and made sure that it prioritizes renewable energy through having 100 percent electric buses to making sure that we phase out all forms of, far, um, of carbon dioxide and create rebates for people that buy solar panels or buy an electric car. And that's really—it's been the most aggressive climate bill in the nation ever since it launched in 2018. And it was really because of the testimonies of myself and many other young people that were mobilized from the White House climate strikes. And directly after the White House climate strikes, it was the third week, we went to testify in front of D.C. Council and make sure they understood the impact that it has on so many kids that are in the D.C. area that really don't really understand the, the scale, scope, or speed of the climate crisis and really don't understand how we can make an impact. And that really showed us that we do have the power to change our political system. And there is a way for young people to affect change. And that's really where it started. And that's really what motivated us to continue to, to mobilize and continue to strike every single Friday. So, Jerome, you hold these uh, protests outside the White House every Friday. You're yards from the president of the United States. Um, he disagrees with well over 95 percent of the world scientists and says climate change is a hoax. What message do you have for him? And why does it matter to you what President Trump says and thinks? My message to him, my message to President Trump would be that there's no more time to continue to accept money from the fossil fuel industry. There's no more time to continue to be bought off and paid for, because this is our lives that we're fighting for. We're fighting for our children. We're fighting for our sisters and brothers. We're fighting for people that are drowning. And around the world, what we're seeing, and it, for example, in, um, in, Wei, in Ai Weiwei's documentary, Human Flow, he talked about how millions of people are being displaced from their communities. And that's really what I want President Trump to understand, is that this isn't just happening in the United States. And the work that we do here affects everyone on this planet. And we must act as such. We must act as one united family and actually take action and not ignore the people that are dying around the world and the people that are burning and drowning and going through a massive amount of suffering for us to have the luxuries that we have in the U.S. and in Europe. We must act as one people and we must be accountable to those people that we are allowing to die on our hands just for our luxuries. You're also, uh, Jerome, you're also the founder and editor-in-chief of The Climate Reporter, a youth-led climate change journalism organization, um, which has writers from all over the world. Explain what it is and why you think media is important here. Yes. So I started The Climate Reporter in the midway through my 10th grade year in high school, and it was really out of the fact that no one was covering climate news and no one was talking about the climate crisis. This was about eight months before Greta Thunberg started her climate strikes, and I really didn't know any other climate activists, young climate activists that were in the movement. So I really wanted to reach out to them and create a platform for us to be able to talk about these issues that we're facing that no one's talking about. So I started it with my English teacher and I. We um, she helped me write articles about the importance of young people being united in this movement and being at the forefront of it. And I wrote about 167 articles in the span of a year. And after writing my 32nd article, um, I reached out to people that were in Australia and Antarctica and Asia and Africa, frontline communities, to make sure that they are at the forefront of this movement. And The Climate Reporter was really an outlet for communities around the world to be able to share what's happening to them and for us to not just 
have a person that goes into their community and tell their story, but giving them the power to tell their own story and to tell their own narrative. Not of a narrative of suffering, but a, of a narrative of resilience and a narrative of being empowered by the fact that it, we, even though we are, we are suffering through all this, we are still trying to survive and that we're still trying to innovate. I interviewed people that were in the Inuit Circumpolar Council who were invited to the COP24 but weren't allowed to sit at the negotiation table even though they have thousands of years of experience. I also went to the Lower Ninth Ward and interviewed people that were, that were there that never had their homes rebuilt, while communities that were surrounding them that were primarily white had their, had their homes New rebuilt Orleans. and money given back to them. But that's really what the work that the Climate Reporter is doing, is centering those voices and making sure they have a voice at the table. Today is Global Climate Strike, inspired by 16-year-old Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg. On Tuesday, youth climate leaders visited Capitol Hill to lend their support to the Green New Deal, co-sponsored by Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey and New York Congress member Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Aramiso Barbosa Ribeiro, an indigenous activist from Brazil, traveled to the U.S. from Brazil for today's climate strike actions. Meu território no Brasil fica no Cerrado. My territory in Brazil is in the dry highlands of the Cerrado. Even the young can see this highland disappearing, and our native plants are dying due to lack of water. If it goes on like this, 20 years from now, my homeland will become a desert. My people will be at risk of becoming history. Right now, the Amazon, home to millions of my relatives, is burning. Continue our roundtable discussion with youth climate activists. Um, we're joined by Shia Bastida, organizer with Fridays for Future here in New York, and Katie Eder, founder of the Future Coalition, where she's currently executive director in Minneapolis, Isra Hersey, executive director and co-founder of U.S. Youth Climate Strike, and Jawari Ajama, co-state lead for the Minnesota Youth Climate Strike. Washington, D.C., Kelsey Juliana, lead plaintiff in the landmark youth climate lawsuit against the U.S. government, and Jerome Foster II, White House Climate Strike organizer, founder and executive director of One Million of Us. On Wednesday afternoon, Greta Thunberg tweeted, in support of youth climate activists who were still attempting to get into the United States, she tweeted, I hear from different sources that many youth climate activists traveling to the U.N. Youth Climate Summit have not been given U.S. visas in time for their travel. If you could start to interact under this tweet, maybe journalists and others can help you speed up the process. That's what Greta Thunberg tweeted. Well, breaking the sound barrier today, we are joined by Democracy Now! video stream by Nasratullah Elam a climate youth activist from Afghanistan, who is invited to participate in Saturday's first-ever U.N. Youth Climate Summit. But the U.S. just rejected his visa. He's a 12th-grade student at the United World College's Thailand International School in Phuket, in Phuket, Thailand, where he's a leader of local sustainability programs. He's from Lakman, Afghanistan. He just learned that this happened. Um, welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Um, Nasratullah, tell us what happened. Uh <clears throat> Thanks for having me uh, in Democracy Now. Uh, so on uh, August 28, uh, that was the date when I got an uh, invitation letter from the United Nations uh, uh, that I was invited to participate in the, as under 18, participate in the United Nations Youth Climate Summit on 21st September. Uh, I applied the U.S. visa on uh, September 9th. Uh, I had my interview in the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok. Uh, uh, it, the early, uh, you had to around. fly to Bangkok from Phuket just to apply? Yeah, uh, I flew uh, from Phuket to Bangkok with uh, a U.S. citizen teacher from my school. Uh, he accompanied me there to Bangkok uh, to apply for the visa, and my uh, interview appointment was 7 a.m., uh, pretty early. And I So in order to get there, we spent a night there in a hotel, and then uh, uh, in the, during the interview, the visa uh, officer in the, in the embassy uh, didn't ask me much question, but a few questions of what I'm doing here and where my family lives and what do they do and uh, what I'm going to do in the future. Uh, and then I made a very quick look at my documents, which was super quick, and told me that uh, I do not qualify for the visa. And so you were how many students applied to be part of the UN Youth Climate Summit? Uh, the information that I had from the United Nations, uh, the organizing team of the Climate Summit, uh, I, I don't really know about the exact number, but they said that uh, 
over 7,000 applicants uh, had applied uh, to be uh, to participate. So, and I was. <laughs> and you were the one who was chosen. Yeah, as an under 18 applicant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us about your home country of Afghanistan and why you're so concerned about it right now. What has made you a climate activist? Uh, so uh, the climate activism uh, uh, started when I uh, when last year, uh, not last year, but like last academic year, I would consider in 2019, the floods uh, hit uh, the western Afghanistan, and more than hundreds of families uh, were evacuated, and most of those families were the nomadic people of Afghanistan who heavily rely on whose economic source heavily rely on livestock. All their livestock were lost, their shelters were lost, or uh, according to sources, 35 lives were lost. And that made me concerned with the, with, with the, with the reason and cause of the flood, because I was not the one agreeing the, the, the traditional view held by the Afghan people about the flood. And taking environmental science as a one of my subjects was uh, another uh, factor that helped me not just to understand how the climate uh, the climate works and how sustainability works, but uh, to make me even more inspired uh, and to have a wise about the uh, about the this issue that's happening that hitting my country and the poor people there are very badly affected uh, in a situation that they do not really have much carbon emission and very low ecological footprint. Like without having scientific tools, just by the interview I had there, just the, the visits I had to the local areas and in, uh, in villages in Afghanistan, by the very primary information, I could say that their ecological footprint and the carbon footprint was way low, way low than, than one. Whereas the sources, uh, online sources, say that it's 0 0.78. But what I could presume is even lower. Uh, whereas in the, the developed countries, let's uh, take a, some European countries, have more than 14, with the United States having more than eight. But when it comes to the impact, uh, it's mostly hated those poor people in those areas that they do not really contribute to this problem. And that's why uh, I started uh, be, I started to, to have a wise and to act as a uh, climate activist. Uh, and when I got the invitation, I was really happy that finally I found uh, an opportunity to have a wise on a global stage where my wise could be here uh, by, by different uh, the people who are really responsible. Uh, and it was just more than an opportunity. It was uh, an opportunity to to go and, and to team with other climate activists and to uh, and the to U help. the UN was going to pay for your trip here and also your stay here. The visa denial you got wasn't even signed. I was listening to a report in Thailand about the denial, and they said somewhere on that denial was the date 2014, not signed, and a date from years ago. Uh, honestly, I really thought I will get the visa because I knew that specifically like, regarding the financial issues, uh, the United Nations, uh, I think, uh, was not paying like for the uh, for flight issues because I was not one of the green ticket winners because I was under 18. But the school was having the financial mm. uh, assurance to the embassy saying that all the travel associate costs will be paid uh, by uh, uh, as much as are needed by the school, and also United Nations was uh, uh, providing me accommodation there. I did not have any financial issues at all. I have all the supportive documents that to totally and completely supported all so the financial. So I want to give I want to give you a chance to talk to some of the students, so you can't do it here. Uh, Katie Eater is with us in New York, one of the lead organizers of this mass climate protest today. Katie, if you'd like to directly address Nasser Tula. Yeah, it's so good to meet you. I think it's so amazing that we're part of the same movement and started part of the same fight, even though we're on totally separate sides of the world. So um, I'm so sorry that we won't be able to meet in person, but glad we're able to connect this way. Uh, and I'm really curious to know. You know, one of the things that we really talk about uh, in the U.S. is that so much of the narrative around climate change is what we're fighting against and often not what we're fighting for. And so I'm curious, what are you fighting for and what's your vision for the future? Well, uh, well, definitely uh, it, we, climate change is a, mostly a future problem, but I don't really uh, see it as a more future problem than a current problem. I see it uh, a kind of uh, the, the problem that currently uh, some parts of the world are more hated uh, by the impacts, uh, as an example of my country. And, uh, well, for the future, I'm not really optimistic that the situation is going to get better, because the, uh, the, the, if you look at the, the previous protocols, like Kyoto or other, that the, the, the idea of the, car, uh, the carbon cap and trade was proposed, the carbon credit and tax was proposed, was not really fully implemented. And multinational corporations, they just kept doing what they were doing 
and I, I think I think if if the situations go like that, I, I don't really feel uh, uh, optimistic, and it, it's gonna the, the impact's gonna get We're wider. And we're going to end with Greta Thunberg. Um, she just tweeted the climate strike demo passing the House of Nobility Stockholm earlier today. Um, I want to turn to her clip from Being on Democracy Now!, the hour we spent with her. I asked her message to young people. My message to, to the young people of the world is that right now we are facing an existential crisis. Um, I mean, the climate and ecological crisis, and it will have a massive impact on our lives in the future, but also now, especially in vulnerable communities. And um, I think that we should, we should wake up, and we should also try to wake the adults up, because they are the ones who their generation is the ones who, who are mostly responsible for this crisis, and we need to hold them accountable. We need to hold the people in power accountable for what they have been doing to us and future generations and other living species on Earth. And we need to, need to get angry and understand what is at stake, and then we need to transform that anger into action and to stand together, united, and um, and just never give up. So that's 16-year-old Greta Thunberg, who will be here in New York as one of the leaders of the climate strike here, as we also talk to leaders all over the country. That does it for our roundtable, but certainly not our coverage. Shia Bastida, thank you for joining us here in New York, and Katie Eater, Jerome Foster II, as well, in Washington, um, who, together with Isra Hirsi, all of you will be at the U.N. Youth Climate Summit on Saturday. Uh, I want to thank Kelsey Juliana and Juari Jama. Uh, and Nasratula Elham. Yes, you couldn't be here in person, but we broke the sound barrier with your voice from Phuket, Thailand. Uh, denied a visa to come to that Youth Climate Summit. But the activism is happening everywhere. Follow our Twitter feed at Democracy Now! We'll be bringing you a special on the actions over the weekend on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us. To see our full discussion with Greta Thunberg, go to democracynow.org.